Welcome, dear viewers and listeners. I'm Rhonda Chervin, and this is the seventh Zoom in a series called The Spirit and Our Daily Life. And I'm with David Dowd, who's my co-author of the book, New Beginnings. Always a new I'm, beginning. Always a new beginning dialogue between broken spiritual warriors. Amen. And so what we're doing after the book is this is a sort of sequel to the book, which you can get on En Route Books. It's published by En Route Books, the same one that runs the radio shows and TV shows of WCAT. So anyway... So we're, what we're trying to do is challenges each week and share on these challenges, challenges how to be holy in daily life. So we start with a prayer. Oh, dear Jesus, this is a big, big challenge for me. This week's challenge was a big challenge for me. And we hope that our viewers and listeners are working on similar challenges, but not just working, opening to your grace by yearning to be a better person in these daily life attitudes and actions. And so we ask you to bless this program today. And over to you, Dave. Dear Jesus, we ask you for your grace and your blessing as we begin this new week in your name. We have fallen in the past, but you have encouraged us to get back up. We have had our, our brokenness in the past, but through the grace of your love, we have understood your healing is in our relationship with you. Please guide us in this, um, this morning's presentation and help us to grow in the peace inside ourselves so that we know your relationship with us sustains us. Amen. So this week I was working on accepting the permissive will of God in daily things. Okay, and... Okay, what does it mean accepting the permissive will of God? This is a source of tremendous confusion among Catholic believers, I think. Catholics continually, we say, thy will be done. Now, God's perfect will will be done. God's perfect will is only the good, like in Eden, only the good. But God permits all sorts of sins caused by us or caused by the same evil spirit who is spirits who are in the Garden of Eden. He permits us with our free will to choose something that isn't his perfect will, but he permits it. So it's, it's his permissive will that we go through different trials and that he permits us to sin, even though it's not his perfect will at all. So thy will be done means his perfect will, but still we have to accept that he permits these things in our lives, which we would rather weren't there that come from the fall of man. So for me, the thing I was working on the most about his permissive will is that I figured out, I happen to have been reading a very interesting book called Addiction and Grace by Gerald May. And in this book, he says there are many other addictions. He's a psychiatrist. He says there are many other addictions besides alcohol, drugs, the ones we're most familiar with, alcohol, drugs, porn, overeating. There are many, many addictions. And the one that I finally isolated most for myself, I would say I'm addicted to anger more than anything else, but, and then anxiety. But part of that anxiety is because I'm addicted to thinking up perfect futures for myself. So when I was a married woman, I had to go along with, with what my husband wanted or what we would decide together. But I became a widow almost 30 years ago. And then 
I started dreaming of perfect futures for myself. First, I wanted to find a perfect second husband. Then I wanted to find a perfect community and a community of prop sisters or widow sisters. Finally, I decided I, God wanted me to be a dedicated widow. But in any case, and then I'd look for different lay communities I could join or communities of widows. And so I tried all these things. And one of the reasons that they failed all those options was because if they weren't perfect, I would leave to look for some other perfect place to go, see? So, okay, in the, in the group I belong to for anger, um, anxiety and depression, Abraham Lowe's Recovery International, which is not 12-step, well, but it's like 12 step. It has these tools. And one of the tools is to say to yourself all the time, listen very closely. This is a huge one. Perfection is a dream, a hope and an illusion. Now that's not true about eternal life. There's where we're going to have perfection, but before eternal life on earth, we're never going to have perfection. So I kept challenging myself with that phrase as I was thinking about um, places to live in my old age. And I'm now 83. Okay. But also I worked on accepting his permiss God's permissive will in the daily life um, reactions to our contemporary tech society. And that's one of the hardest things for older people is I read somewhere that anything that was invented after you were 35 seems unnatural to you. So mm -hmm. this whole thing, which I face every day, which is that everything is done by division of labor with tech where one person who answers the phone at a given agency doesn't even know what the next person is doing, just transfers you to the next person. You have to repeat all this information, all your passwords, all your information, sometimes seven times, and then the phone clicks off just when you think you've gotten to the right person. So I find this so annoying and upsetting, but I have to accept that it was God's permissive will, see Dave, it's God's permissive will that I grew up at this time in the history of the world right. where tech is all over. And I right. have to be thankful for the good of tech. I mean, I remember when I was at first had little kids, we went to Disneyland and you could go into this place and see this little phone where you could actually see people's pictures while they were talking on the phone. And we thought this will never be while we live. It was so extraordinary. So the joy of the fact, I have to be so thankful for the joy that I could see Dr. Mahfoud who runs the station. I could see David who is one of my best friends who is my spiritual warrior, spiritual friend, that I can actually see his face. And hear, and I can hear your voice. <laughs> right. So if we got rid of all tech and went back to the farm, I wouldn't, of course, the people on the farm have tech too, but you know what I mean. Right. So, okay. So that was my week was working on trying to accept. The, and every time I accepted the permissive will of God, I could get through the tech problem with a little less anger, a little less anger, see? Well, Rhonda, this is very interesting to me because the idea of permissive will of God is a permissive will that, um, you know, we come to understand through the circumstances of our life. <clears throat> and, and I think the, the uh, changes that take place in one's life um, the battles that we fight, the, uh, the battles that we lose, um, are all part of his molding. You know, uh, I think of Fulton Sheen, who wrote a book about treasure, the title of his book was Treasures in Clay. And, and we're, con we're being molded through these experiences. My work from this last, uh, during this last week was to continue working on bringing balance into my life. 
um, learning to moderate my responses, uh, trying to keep perspective. Um, um, and I also made a promise that I would follow my regular routine, manage my blood sugar, um, daily exercise, including daily spiritual exercise. And I'm working on listening to people, uh, trying not to overtalk them, um, trying to allow moments to flourish. Uh, to guide my responses, I had found this quote, which I, I'm going to repeat because I really love this quote. Help me to enter into the mind of everyone who talks with me and to keep me alive to the feelings of each one present. Give me a quick eye for little kindnesses that I may be ready to share them and gracious in receiving them. Give me a quick perception of the feelings and needs of others and make me eager hearted. I like the word eager hearted in helping them. Um, now, my results from this past week were mixed. Um, here's where I failed. I failed to watch my blood sugar. I was in Orlando uh, working with pro-life friends this past weekend and uh, doing uh, work on the sidewalks. But I was staying um, you know, in a place other than my own. Uh, so I was away from my daily routine and my meals and I did not discipline my portion and selections. So I need to keep working on this. Um, and the second big point for me was, I do think I succeeded in listening to others. Several opportunities for improvement occurred. Um, as I learned to withhold my story, I found people opened up and I could learn more from others than by simply sharing with the ideas I previously had had. So, um, this brings me into an awareness in terms of a situation I find myself. Um, you know the saying, it is easier for a camel to go through the head of a pin than for a rich person to get to heaven. Now, I'm not a rich person by any means, but um, I find an interesting paradigm happening in my life. Some of my neighbors may be skeptical of my spiritual foundation. And through social pressures, I feel they're providing comments, perhaps ordinary to their business management practices, but I feel the little, um, you know, the worldview, and I feel the sense of this being imposed on me. But I also have many dear pro-life friends, and some of them may see me as, um, I'm going to say comfortable. Um, so many of us live according to um just pouring our hearts out for the poor and the poor being the unborn in the wombs of their mothers. Um, and some of my pro-life friends can be skeptical in their own way. Um, and through the social practices they, that they practice, um, I sometimes feel the need to prove myself. Well, as Taylor Marshall says, uh, if you want to be on the team, say the rosary. <laughs> so I find myself turning to my rosary and realizing that God has given me a challenge to serve Jesus Christ in these particular circles. And I'm learning this requires much discernment. So I'm digging into the idea of, of, of discernment. Um, God is good. Um, I was standing in a prayer circle, uh, actually standing in prayer beside a parking lot um, in an abortion clinic in Orlando, Florida on Saturday. 20 or 30 cars were jammed into the parking lot, which was down a hill behind the abortion, the abortion mill. And there was a line on the, uh, on the driveway, meaning we could stay on the neighbor's driveway, but we couldn't go on the driveway of the abortion clinic. Then I took a few pictures. Suddenly, a young man bolted out of his car, walked up 10 feet from me, and demanded I leave. And I said, I'm here praying. And he demanded again. And I said, well, um, I'm following God's law and I'm, I'm going to stay here and pray. And Rhonda, I felt a real sense of peace. I felt an incredible sense of peace because this young man looked at me and he almost didn't seem to know what he was going to say. And, you know, I just stayed and was calm 
And then he turned and he went back to his car. So I mm. felt peace standing my ground and understanding that, you know, the peace we give others is the peace they're going to receive. And, and this is, goes back to this beautiful uh, sense of the graces that we pray that we can reflect and share with other people. Um, you know, I just want to interrupt you for a second. Um, I was in the pro-life, I was active in the pro-life I movement, never on the sidewalk with praying, your praying in front of abortion clinics for about 20 years in all different places. But for right. those of our listeners and viewers who don't have, haven't had that experience, the thing is that many of you don't know that there are huge, the fantastic stories of abortionists who are responsible for, you know, tens and thousands of abortions who became, who left and became part of the pro-life movement, who converted many of them to the Catholic Church. Partly afterwards, they said, because of the love shown them by those of us outside those clinics, that uh, in the case of Abby Johnson, who is running a clinic, I mean, the, all the women protesters would talk to her, would wish her a happy birthday, would talk to her about her family, all this stuff. So they didn't treat her as a monster who they just hated. So she, also acknowledged, she also acknowledged Father Frank Pavone in his priestly garb and Sean Carney with 40 Days for Life. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, but um, this isn't a program about that as such, but it just shows that a thing of being good and polite and loving, even to people you consider to be your, the worst enemies of humanity, can change them. Right, right. With God's grace. Oh, okay. So now when, we have. I have another occasion. And on another occasion, I was doing my stretching. I live in Florida during the winter. I was doing my stretching on, on a beach and a woman approached me. Um, by withholding my story, she eventually introduced me to her cousin and her cousin was still grieving having lost her son in a motorcycle accident three years ago. They each had lost a grown adult son and their description of their suffering provided deep insights into the wounds suffered by broken maternal bonds. And Rhonda, you and I understand this because you've lost a son and I've lost a brother. But this realization of these maternal bonds and how deeply felt and how, how they're, they're, they're forever bonds was, was just an affirmation I received, again, because I withheld my story. Okay, so those are, God gives us, the Holy Spirit gives us instances when we accept a challenge he gives us instances both of failure and both of victory through him where we can see clearly that it was a good to, it was good to try to accept that challenge and um, I was realizing thinking about this recording today that one of the reasons I got into providing challenges for people as a teacher concrete challenges was right. because I came into the church with all people who were in this third order, in this case, Oblates of St. Benedict, and some people don't even know that that exists. So there are lay people who are part of groups that surround specific religious orders. And so they're called, they used to be called third order Franciscans or Benedicts and Oblates or third order Dominicans. And because I came into the church with such, in some, with such a group, all of these people were under, had spiritual directors and all of them were always working on improving their characters, see? Right. And I don't think that's true of all people, even though every homily is designed to challenge us to improve in some way. Right. We don't necessarily see this as a big part of our lives. But for you who are viewers and listeners, if you're not part of a group within the church, there are other groups like Opus Dei, um, oh, many, many groups, Legion of Mary, many groups of lay people 
who are very apostolic, that is, they're trying to evangelize others, but also always working on trying to do better themselves. And so, you know. This is, this is very, very helpful. I've had the privilege of working with the Trappist monk. And in working with the Trappist monk, I've, I've developed my prayer life, and I've, I've developed the opportunity to come back to this whole sense of understanding, acquiring the virtues, right? provides us the weapons we need to fight deadly sin. And <clears throat> as Father Kiefer said to me many years ago, you know, we don't just acquire the virtues by going into a store and looking on a counter and taking something off a, off a counter and just, you know, all of a sudden we have the virtues. We have to work at them. They're trial and error. We're going to be in situations where we're, um, you know, opposed by pride. We're opposed by lust. We're opposed by greed. We're opposed by anger. And so we have to think in terms of the um, uh, corresponding virtue. And um, each, of our, each of our deadly sins does have a corresponding virtue. And so we become mindful. All right, you know, um, I've lost my temper plenty of times, Rhonda. And so I have to think of meekness. And I have to think of, all right, I have to, next time I'm in a, pres in a moment where I want to get angry at something, I maybe have to remember humility, the root of all sin, right? Is pride the countermanding yeah. virtue? Is meekness, and I mean, is uh, it's humility, and then we have to practice meekness. Yeah. Well, to go back to my example on what you just said, Dave, um, working with people on the other end of the a phone line or at a government agency, the person, right. the persons whose job only entails that they ask you this one question. Not that they fill you in on everything you really need to know. That's the next person's job if you ever get to the next person. That person isn't responsible for that whole system. So to get angry at that person because they didn't tell you what you need to know is unjust because they're right. told, don't talk to them to any, about anything except this one point, <laughs> see? So I always apologize profusely when I get angry at them. But let's go on to our challenge for this week. Now, for us, we happen to be, you might be listening to this program anytime. So it won't be for you. Holy Week is next week for us. And what I always try to do in the last, the week of Holy Week, leading into the Easter Triduum, which is... Um, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, the Saturday Vigil Sunday, is to work on all the things we've done since the beginning of these seven do the Zooms, all the things I've been working on. So I want to just try for one week to avoid all these things that are negative, such as catastrophic thoughts. The catastrophic thought is I'm old, I'm going senile, I should throw the computer into the lake because it causes me anger. Or picking my fingers, or um, thanking God for tech instead of complaining. Praying to Jesus, knowing he's really there, so not interrupting my time to commune with Jesus by getting up to do this little thing, that little thing. Um, doing deep breathing prayers to be peaceful. I go like this, four, three breaths in, four breaths out while looking at a, by the face of Jesus on my computer or adoration, uh, TV adoration. Good, good. And just praying deeply that way, the name of Jesus to get out of feeling anxious good. and trying to pray before talking about any important thing to someone instead of blurting something out and then thinking that wasn't such a good idea. To try to live in the now instead of the future and to accept the permissive will about everything in the whole rest of my life instead of thinking about it obsessively with anxious thoughts. So that's a big my challenge for next week. And David, what are you planning? Well, um, I've got to keep, continue to work on, uh, you know, my listening skills. I have to continue to keep balance in my life. Um, I have to learn to unplug my inner stress cord. Um, you know, I like to write poetry, and I think words are very important. And 
you know, sometimes um, if I'm in the middle of doing something and I'm trying hard to reach an objective and all of a sudden I forget a piece or forget, you know, um, um, a person whose name I wanted to remember or a particular vocabulary word and something I'm writing, I can get angry at myself. So I have to start reminding myself that the devil wants dress and God wants bless. And so I, I was saying my inner saying is going to be bless, not stress. Oh, so I these love it. I love these it. Mom these moments that, that create, you know, um, that anger or that frustration or that um, impatience with myself. I need to practice, right? Acquiring virtue takes practice. If I fall, I have to get back up. If I forget, I have to remind myself. And gradually, I become aware that I'm going to say, bless, not stress. Okay. So, um, you know, I think this, these, this Holy Week is a, is a time that I also prepare for. Um, I actually took my calendar, <clears throat> excuse me, and I blocked off the, the entire Thursday afternoon and evening, um, Good Friday, particularly between noon and three o'clock, um, Holy Saturday, and of course, Easter Sunday. And um, I had the privilege of um, street preaching in Boston with the image of Jesus from the, sh from the uh, Shroud of Turin with his face. And this image of Jesus on the Shroud is the reminder of the moment he rose from the dead, the moment he destroyed the power of sin over us. But if we have occasion to either have seen or maybe can see the passion of Christ, all of a sudden these, this Easter tritium takes on a, a, a whole different awareness. We become aware just how much Jesus gave himself to the permissive will of his father. And, you know, he was fitted for a cross. Well, we're being fitted for crosses ourselves with our own uh, insecurities, our own impatience, um, you know, our own mistakes, our own times we fall. But just like, Simon came to help Jesus. Other people come to help us. Rhonda has come to help me many times. Rhonda's one of my Simons. So find Simons. So, you know, you can experience this love of Christ, even if you're at our age and you're being fitted for your cross. You know, they're each an individual and, and unrepeatable. Um, there are Simons there to help you. And there is God whose love is everlasting. Amen, amen, amen. So all of you, we wish, if you're watching this week, we wish you a beautiful Holy Week. If not, whenever you're listening to this, we ask you to go to En Route Books and Media, that's E-N, capital R-O-U-T-E, Books and Media, and look for our book, Always a New Beginning, if you want more of this kind of dialogue. And that book also has Lots of beautiful poems of David in them, which uh, people like very much. So now we are going to say thank you, Jesus, for this good time together and bless us until we meet again. Amen. Amen.